looking for life out there. You don't want to bring it from Kennedy Space Center with you and then discover it up there. You'd want to make sure that it's truly Martian. Likewise, when you come back to Earth, the Outer Space Treaty says, when you do launches, you avoid harmful contamination. Well, what's harmful? You and I breathe on each other all the time, and if I have a cold or smallpox, that could be harmful. But normally, it's not a problem. So how do you set the standards for that? And how do you set standards so that you could tell a design engineer, yes, this is what you got to do to contain the samples when you're coming back, or this is how that arm has to be sterilized before it grabs something from the soil. So there's all sorts of design and pre-planning things that go into it. So these are legal constraints that then have an effect on the rocket scientist and the scientists who are doing the science on the mission. So when Mars sample return was hoped for 2007, um, already in the late 1990s, people began talking about, well, what kind of containment should be allowed? And NASA asked the National Research Council to take a look at that issue. And they looked at it and basically said, anything that might be a replicating organism is the concern. That's our concern. So if something's toxic or radioactive, we're concerned about it to keep our scientists and others um, healthy. But those aren't the concerns of a sort like an invasive species. So the, what I want to do with you guys is play with this notion of, OK, we've got astrobiology. We have outer space treaty that says no harmful contamination. That means that every time we send a mission, we think about planetary protection, what we're sending up there and what we're bringing back. And I like to put the stoplight there because it's not a red light. It's not saying, whoa, don't ever bring anything back. But it's a cautionary light, a yellow light that says stop and think about it before you do it. And it works through. Committee on Space Research, which is an international group of scientists that work, report to the United Nations, and think about issues like this. So um, let me go on to the next. There's one more slide. So what we have is behind the scenes planning that goes on. It rarely gets talked about except for in meetings like this or science meetings. And so what it is is legal constraints. We're always changing and updating the, the based on the science and the technology. When we think about sending something out forward contamination, we've got it down pretty routine. We clean it, we clean spacecraft, we assemble them in a clean room, and when we send our rovers, our orbiters, and things, they, they um, uh, fulfill the constraints of the international policies. When we talk about bringing back a sample from Mars, this is the first time we brought back samples like this when we were planning since Apollo. So how would you do that? The laws have changed, the science has changed, the technology has changed. We as citizens ask questions that we never did about that time. And so how would you do it? So that's the first game I want to play with you. And then I want to, so I gave you these papers in part to show you there's some great colloquia that you can attend down at SETI, but also take out your pencils and I want you to start working with people nearby and jot down things. If you were going to bring, say I got samples here today. I got samples from Mars, and they would fill a coffee cup, okay? And I'm going to safely study them and determine if life is in them. What do I do? What are the questions you would want to ask? There's no wrong answers, really. What is it? What are the questions? What is it? Okay, so I'm bringing back dusts, I'm bringing back gases, and I'm bringing back pebbles, okay? So what is the nature of the sample that you're bringing back? Good question. Okay, it's not going to be green elephants. I already know that. Okay, so I'm going to have samples of three different types. Okay, next question that I deal with. Anybody got any ideas? Okay, I got these samples. I want to sample them. I want to look at them and see if there's life in them. Uh, go ahead. I can't see you, so go ahead. Would you look for respiration? So that ah. Okay, so she's starting to say, if it's life, I'm assuming it's going to be life as I know it, so it maybe respires or metabolizes. So yes, I could look for an outgassing or something. So there's one kind of test I might do. Any other kind of test you'd want to do? Come on, guys. Add water. You, what's that? Add water. Add water. Now, add water. Now, this is kind of what they did on the Viking missions. Have you heard the, the uh, discussion about whether we might have already found life up on Mars? They added radioactively labeled water on Mars and looked at the off-gassing. Um, they hadn't found any carbon in the soil, but they did see some off-gassing. So some people say, you already found life up there. So yes, if you add water, 
what does that tell you? If I add, add water to some things, uh, maybe I can generate carbon dioxide. That's not the same as life. So if I get out gassing, you're starting to get it. So then, and then I would say, then what kind of, okay, if I'm going to add water, I better have at water available. And it better be distilled water. So you start to see how you're do doing all this. Where do I do this? Somewhat contained. What's that mean? A space station ad, that question actually came up too. If you bring it back to space station, it turns out that all of the things we know about life here and infection and such are done in 1G. If you bring it back to space station, you'd have to do all of the science up there to know how to calibrate basically all the tests that you're going to do. In addition, if there were a contaminant, now you've contaminated space station. Actually, when we went to the moon and brought back rocks, the um, commander of the aircraft carrier that picked up the, um, the Apollo 11 astronauts had two sets of orders. One was, seriously, one was um, if there was evidence of contamination, the ship would become the quarantine vessel and would not be allowed to dock. And if everything went okay, as it did, it came into Pearl Harbor. The astronauts were still in a biocontainment chamber, and that was offloaded, put onto a flatbed truck, taken over to an Air Force cargo plane and flown to Houston. So all of this was thought about in the Apollo missions. So where you're going to do it is very important too. And the Apollo missions, they had a whole lab that they built in Houston. Well, you could say, take it there. Ah, they don't have it anymore. It's turned into offices and lab space. So now we, so you have to say, okay, what kind of lab? So a quarantine lab, glove boxes. We went to the CDC and said, how do you contain things? Okay, so you got it in a glove box. And you're going to open it up. You're going to take out your pebbles and stuff. What's the first test you want to do? Chemical composition. Absolutely. You can't do biological before looking at it. You know? How about look at it and see if you see anything? Okay? Is there something that looks like a shape? Looks like a worm? Looks like a something? Because life is nothing more than chemical reactions in a membrane, in a bag. We're all, you know, lots of them. But think of a cell. It's chemistry in a bag, so the first thing you look for is physical chemical characterization. Photograph them, curate them. These are really precious resources. So all of this discussion went on, and over a two-year period, we got together experts in all sorts of things to ask these kinds of questions. And there's actually a protocol, a draft protocol, for sampling and handling and testing Martian mater return materials. It's available um, for anybody to see. It's been studied and approved by lots of scientists. And the idea, it was a draft protocol. We knew that it, we were asking, are we able to bring things back safely and legally? And the answer is yes. We could do it back in 2002 when we finished this process. And the nice thing about it is that we'll only get better. Science gets better. The resolution of equipment gets better. Now after 9-11 and all the anthrax threats, we have much better biosafety labs and a lot more people know how to do it. We know a lot more about microbes than we did. So all of that goes into it in behind the scenes and starts to talk about how we handle and contain materials. But then we have another question, which is, at what point do you release the samples? We had to do that with Apollo, too. We had a whole set of tests that were done. The, the astronauts were let out, let out of quarantine in about 30 days. They weren't sick. Nothing seemed to be amiss. Um, but the rocks and samples were kept in a lot longer. And now they're not kept in. They're in museums all over the country, all over the world. But at the time, we were still asking the question for months afterwards, I think uh, six months to a year, um, is there life in them? And they were not released to the public until then, until we could verify it. So that question of what do you want to show before you release them? What are the criteria for release? What are the scientific criteria? It's not an e easy thing to do. And also then probably what are the legal criteria? There are no, you don't pull a book off the shelf to, to think about these things. The, the laws and the policies, the laws can get made at any time. The policies that follow from those, thou shalt have clean air or clean water. What does that mean? Swimmable, drinkable, fishable water? for the average person. Who's the average person? A young kid, an immunocompromised one. So all of these things are very negotiable within our um, laws and regulations and still very good science practices. So anybody got any other ideas or questions about returning samples from Mars? Mm -hmm. well,
Very good observation. And the next thing I was wondering about was, okay, they got out of the capsule, I don't know how, but then they somehow got into the trailer. And I thought, well, what kind of quarantine is this? You look at the trail. They're, they're you know, even on the deck of the uh, aircraft carrier, they're, it seemed to me that they were leaving a trail, and I thought, so much for quarantine. Okay. If, very, very good. This is, so there's a lot of scenario playing, playing that goes through. You think about exactly where they're going to walk, what they're going to do, what they're going to eat, where you're going to, where do you flush away their waste if they're in a 30-day quarantine? What happens to the waste when it goes out? Does it just go out into the sewage system, or do you autoclave it before it goes out? So there are lots and lots of things you have to think about, and those are very good. Yes, we do know. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you the story, but we in the Bay Area are really fortunate. You can actually go on the USS Hornet up in Alameda. It's an aircraft carrier, and it has a quarantine module, and it's one of the actual quarantine modules. It was used in Apollo 14. Okay, so when they were thinking about all of that, they, they developed a whole set of tests, and the idea was to pick up the capsule with a crane, bring it onto the deck, lock it into the... Um, to the quarantine module. Remember the movie E.T. and it had kind of a clear plastic tunnel? So that was supposed to be like that. Well, it turned out it was too, the waters were too rough, the, um, the crane wasn't big enough, so they, were, they let the capsule go into the water. Uh, in addition, they vented the capsule way up high because it was very, very hot inside the capsule. So there's your first breach. The second breach, they get in the water, the, the SEALs, the Navy divers, jump out of the helicopter, pop the hatch. But what they threw in was biological isolation gear. So they had a special suit with special respirators. So they didn't walk across the deck in spacesuits. They were already in containment. But you're right that they walked across. In addition, the SEALs, so the Navy divers, might have been exposed to something. Um, and the doctor who was locked in with them in the module had to sign things off. And I met him and his wife at the 40th anniversary of the Apollo um, landing that was on the Hornet. And the wife said that she had to sign a, um, uh, you know, um, freedom, not, not freedom, I'm a sorry, waiver. a waiver and, yeah, informed consent. That's what I'm trying to look for, informed consent, that she understood that she didn't know what, her ha what would happen to her husband. And he, as a doctor, had to sign that as well. Um, so we think about those legal implications as well as the ethical ones. Is that sufficient informed consent? But so um, actually they sunk, they sunk the leftover um, uh, airbags around the capsule into the Pacific Ocean after it was all done. <laughs> so if, we, if there were life on the moon, we would have it here. But we can move forward and identify from what we did then, which was kind of best available technology then, and bring it forward. So we're pretty sure when we're bringing back just handfuls of soil, rocks, and gases from Mars, we can seal them up within something that's small and won't be opened until we get it into a glove box in a lab. So they still be got how to build a lab and what laws to apply and um, should it be in your backyard or not and what kind of hearings do you have to let people know what's there. So there's a lot of work behind it. Any other? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do these um, protocols apply to the private enterprise? But surprisingly, the private enterprise people will tell you that it doesn't apply to them, but they're wrong. Um, <laughs> the government will get you. Yeah, I'm actually looking at that a lot. So the, the question is about where the laws go. So the Outer Space Treaty is most definitely in place. And every mission that we've sent to the moon and beyond has been a science mission or a government mission. Think about it that way. Everything we've done in outer space otherwise has been low Earth orbit. So all the lawyers, all of the commercial people, they think satellites, they think all of the law that applies to them in low Earth orbit, planetary protection doesn't apply there. We're not concerned about transfer of microbes. We know what, what's up there. It's, it's Earth microbes. Uh, we're maybe concerned about whether someone gets sick or whether there's you know, an increase in virulence or something. But so planetary protection doesn't apply to any of the commercial missions now. As soon as they go up to the moon or beyond, it will. And the law, the, the articles in the um, Outer Space Treaty said that any government that's a signatory of the treaty, and the US is, um, is subject to making sure that their citizens 
and they, they approve and uh, review any proposals to do anything in space, whether by government, agency, or non-governmental entity. So it will apply to others. Um, but what it means, we don't know yet. So that's another place where laws and regulations will happen. Um, any other questions about Mars sample return? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in particular, when, when, if you talk about an astronaut finally getting to Mars and getting in the sample, hard to put on a spacesuit without touching the spacesuit, right? So, Are you? do you have to do something before you step out of the, the capsule to sterilize the outside of the spacesuit? Okay. This is what I gave you the pieces of paper for. Did you have another question about the samples first before we go to that? I was just wondering if there's any countries that have, that might have space capability that aren't signatory. Ah, good question too. Um, so up until now, all of this stuff, Coast Bar, oh, Coast Bar, the one little circle there, that was um, a, a group of scientists. It's an international non-governmental agency of scientists that advises the UN, but there's nothing legal about it. So up until now, all of it is a gentleman's club, basically, that says, I'll do good science if you do good science. Um, over 100 countries have sound, signed the Outer Space Treaty, though, so everybody's pretty much on board with it. But there's no planetary protection police up there. There's nobody that we've got up patrol cars on the moon or anything like that. So it really is, we're at the point where legally there's some very interesting things that are coming on. It's all self-governance, and NASA is very good at it. And I can say that, and the Europeans have a planetary protection officer. So by and large, it works. And now as we get more and more people going beyond Earth orbit, now we're going to start to see a new regime come along. But you asked a question about humans, and that's what I want to play with now. So what I want to ask is you get kind of, oh, OK. Um, so, uh, using electromagnetic, uh, I'm, ah, don't know. That's a good question. Um, at this point, I think people are looking more at um, more evidence of structural, chemical, and typical life you'd see if you look for a microbe. So that would be an interesting thing to ask. I don't believe that anybody had talked about it. But when you ask questions about what you might want to do for a test, that has implications for what kind of equipment you make sure you have ahead of time. Now, when thinking about um, what it would mean if we discover life, I can develop a protocol, and I developed a protocol, we developed one for what to do if you find it in uh, a glove box here on Earth, in samples. What do you do if a rover finds it on Mars? Wow, any ideas? What if we find life on Mars with Curiosity rover? What do we do? Do we bring the sample back? Do we leave it there? So oh, there is no policy right now for what to do if we find life up there. And then there's another way we could discover it, which is with a human. What if a human finds it? What is the protocol for that? Drop it and run? <laughs> it's going to take you how long to get back? So you have to think about all these scenarios. So one scenario I've developed, and I've done it in classrooms a lot, is to th you identify the risks, you identify the design implications, and you start to assess what you might do. You start to think about emergency responses, legal questions. Okay, So we've already gone through what you do for sample return, and I want to give you this scenario for on Mars, when we have humans. Okay, During one of the human missions to Mars in 2032, the crew collects numerous samples of rocks, soils, and gases during their routine field examination. And they're looking forward to bringing them back to the lab here on Earth for more study, because you can't have all the equipment you want up there. Preliminary studies indicate that the presence of an unknown light form, although they can't be sure it's there, it might be an issue. They're not sure if it's a forward contaminant or not, but it looks like they got something that's life. And they don't have the equipment to study it on Mars. Scientists back on Earth are eagerly awaiting the return of the astronauts and the Martian materials so that more testing can be done. Everyone is excited about the possibility we may have discovered extraterrestrial life. And you can bet the media will be in on this, too. Now, prior to Earth return, while packing samples, one of the astronauts notices a breach, a tear, a break, a rip, in one of the sampling bags, and realizes that an unknown amount of unsterilized Martian material may have been released into the lab area where the astronauts work. And perhaps, Holly, oh, look up. There's a vent. Huh. It might have gotten into the air supply and vent system of the lab. 
which is separate from the habitat, but nonetheless circulates. So the crews radio to Earth and ask for an emergency video meeting. Now, mind you, it takes 18 minutes for that call to get down to Earth because of the time lag. And they want to have experts talk to them about what to do. Put your mindset in. Now, I see a powder on the Bay Bridge. What do I do about it? Call 911. What does 911 do about it? Okay, so they make a phone call and say, I want experts down in there for a video conference. We don't want to do anything. We don't, we don't know if we should launch back right now. What do we do? What do you do? Pardon me? <laughs> Shoot what in orbit? Nuke them. Okay, okay. That's, uh, what, that was, that's one of my later questions. No, no, let's, let's just be, let's be level-headed. Let's not go off like a crazed chicken. Let's just pretend that we keep our head about us and say, okay, what do we do, want to do? I've got a spill. Basically, I've got a spill. What do I do? Well, how many months is it until they return? Ah, good question. Okay, how many months? And could that isolation be a good thing? Or, or could that be an incubation period for something that uh, an astronaut's contaminated with? Good question. Mm -hmm. Turn off the vents. There we go. Sure, treat it like a spill first. They got to wait. They got to do something real fast. Turn off the fence. And uh, so I said, there's one astronaut. Maybe you isolate that astronaut. We actually said maybe you have an isolation area for an astronaut. Which, what's that? Can the lab is already isolated. That was one of the design criteria ahead of time. So yes, and make sure it really is. Close everything down. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you go through all these kinds of questions, and then you say, you know, what, who would you want in the, um, down below on Earth during your, in your video conference? What kind of specialist would you want? You can't fill a room with hundreds of people. Who do you want down there? Microbiologist. Uh, a microbiologist, OK. Hazardous who? Hazardous materials. Hazardous materials people? I heard someone say CDC. OK. Anybody else? How about the engineer that designed the habitat? Okay, where's the, where does that stuff, if it's just on the way out and vented, it maybe isn't a problem. So you, you can see you have to start thinking about all these things that might go on. Um, did you turn, yeah, turn off the vent, that's the first one, okay. When, it's interesting, when I've done some of this exercise with kids in school, it's the younger kids who say, why don't you make sure that also you have the family or a priest or a minister or somebody to talk to the astronauts or psychologist. This is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty antsy situation. So there's more than just the engineers or the scientists that you might want. And then you have to think if you want to do some science on to make sure, test it. You know, maybe it's just a powder. It doesn't mean anything. So if you have, you want to test it, then you would have had to send the equipment up two years before. So what kind of materials and test materials and instruments do you want up there before you? And how much weight is that? And could that have gone up on a mission? So you start to see how it impacts earlier in the mission. And then the final question really is, so if you got everything under control and you decide, okay, let's bring them back. Since you know that some or all of the crew may have been exposed to unknown life forms and perhaps contaminated, is it safe to bring the astronauts and spacecraft back to Earth? Someone already mentioned take it to space station. That's a possibility. Should the crew remain on Mars or come home? And where do they come to? And if you quarantine them, for how long? Talk with a few of your people around you. Just, just make some notes and decide whether you would bring the astronauts home. This is not a joke. <laughs> this is a real question. Would you bring the astronauts home? Would you bring them someplace else? How long? What are some of the things you'd want to think about in terms of bringing astronauts home? And they will think about these things. You want it? Okay. Just talk for a few minutes around in, in your aisle. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
and before that there was Andromeda Strain. Do you remember that one? Andromeda Strain was written by Michael Crichton, who's a medical doctor, who was, and wrote great science fiction, and that thing still reads really, really well. That was good. And there's another one that, um, the one who did Da Vinci Code, Brown, um, he did one that is uh, about bringing asteroids hitting up in uh, the North Pole, and that one is also pretty accurate as well. Oh, yeah, that's like yeah. All right, so how many of you would, uh, what would you do? Would you bring them home? Make, what's this? Somebody's got to make a decision, and I'm not even sure who would be the one making a decision. We could talk about that. All right, would you bring them home? is that we have been, we have gotten Martian detritus mm -hmm. landing on the Earth before and nothing happened. Okay. And anything that didn't co-evolve with us as evolved as, as, evolved as we are is so unlikely That's to find a, 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 a viable home that it can uh, use us as a, a host for is beyond vanishing. Okay, okay, so she's saying uh, vanishingly small, can't put numbers at it, but you know, if, it, if there's no life up there that we know of, uh, then it's vanishing, vanishingly small that a microbe up there would have a host in us because we're not, and, and that is in fact the same logic that the people in the National Research Council used when they were thinking about bringing back samples from Mars. Is it something we should even contemplate? And they said, number one, most microbes aren't infectious, and number two, path, host pathogen says our biology is such that probably low, 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 low probability. They even used the word vanishing low, vanishingly low, but not zero. So therefore, um, so you still might want to contain that one astronaut or something like that. What did other people say? Mm -hmm. Oh, down, down to zero on time. Okay. Any other? Mm -hmm. If there is a rich genetic code for Earth viruses, and there's a, there's a possibility that we've been exchanging um, matter with other planets, we can at least check for that, even though, you know, we can at least check for like the, the most common markers for the viruses. For mm -hmm. the but it's really hard because, you know, we have trillions of microbes in our body and we're not choosing for common ones, um, but you could, you, and that's what you hope you do when you start bringing back the samples, to start looking for things and, and asking those questions so that by the time you do it with humans, you actually have a look, lot more information. Um, there is no right or wrong answer and often I, I sort of uh, gave you a little bit of my secret, which was that some people say bring them to the moon, some people say bring them to space station. Some people say bring them to Earth and quarantine them here. You can stump you by saying how long is a good quarantine and what are the symptoms you look for. So you can see these are very real questions that play out behind a mission and especially will play out behind human missions because all of our missions have been to low Earth orbit. Our spacesuits, our rovers, everything are designed for on orbit and we are now talking about going down onto a planetary surface where there's dirt. Scientists don't call it dirt, but there's dirt and it can come into to the filters and everything else. So there's a lot to consider, and that's why there's a lot of incremental steps. But some of these steps aren't just science steps. They're science, they're law, they're Center for Disease Control, they're other areas, and um, they're fascinating to think about. Mm -hmm. and another scenario I just thought about is that uh, uh, thorough sterilization before you leave the surface of Mars. Thorough sterilization? Sterilization of yeah. what? You can't sterilize a person without killing well, them. I mean, uh, so so for they're not they're always in suits. That's right. So that's part of it. It's the, that's right. When you go down into the uh, the deep ocean, you may want to step out and look at those neat tube worms or frogs or whatever else, not frogs. So, and then you sterilize yeah, the suit. And you you can't you can't do it. So everything is done robotically. So then then you just got to make sure you're not bringing things in. But just wanted to let you know there's lots and lots of things and it's not just like it's not like discovering extraterrestrial intelligence which is just a signal. This is a very real thing when we're talking about bringing back things in a um, in a spacecraft to the earth. Or me? Is it possible? What? Is it possible to have a chamber attached to the space? Capital? Yes, people have talked about that too. Yeah, they do. Like some yeah, so this this exercise gets really fun and it's wonderful for student um, assignments because you can then say design something or think about what you would want to know, what you would want to have in it. Well, I don't want to take up the time for the next speaker. And if anybody's interested in more of this, I can. I'm happy to share information with you and point you to resources uh, or even give you some of these questions for fooling around. But anyway, thanks for your questions and thanks for <laughs> playing the game.